Atlas V, the Boeing Starliner spacecraft appears to be plagued by a persistent curse, as it has yet again been delayed. Yes, once again, and this time, the problem lies not with Atlas V, but with Starliner itself. SpaceX has a new problem, NASA has a new problem, and the race to mine asteroids is heating up. Following on from recent conversations about the ongoing investigation of the problems with the heat shield on NASA's Orion space capsule, a new report from an independent watchdog organization released on May 1 shows that the Artemis program might be about to face another long delay. Find out everything in today's episode of AB Space. Starliner had been scheduled to lift off this Friday on the 17th of May on crew flight test, a mission that will send NASA astronauts Suni Williams and Butch Wilmore to the International Space Station for a roughly a day stay. But that's no longer the plan. Teams detected a small helium leak in Starliner's service module. This means the first crew launch of Boeing Starliner spacecraft running years behind schedule and more than $1.4 billion over budget won't happen before next Tuesday, the 21st at 4.43 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. In fact, Mission Commander Barry Butch Wilmore and co-pilot Sunita Williams had hoped to take off on the Starliner's first pilot at flight last Monday. They were in the process of strapping in when the countdown was called off because of trouble with an oxygen pressure relief valve in the rocket's Centaur upper stage. Two days later, the Atlas V was hauled off the launch pad and moved back to the ULA's nearby vertical integration facility where the suspect valve was replaced. Tests confirmed the rocket is good to go for another launch attempt. In the latest update, Boeing representatives declared the previous troublesome valve was replaced and is behaving normally. But there's another problem. The unrelated helium leak in the Starliner's propellant pressurization system was noted during the countdown last week, but it remained within safe limits for flight. After the Atlas V and Starliner were rolled back to the VIF for the oxygen valve replacement, managers decided to take a closer look at the helium issue. The newfound helium leak, Boeing said, has been traced to a flange on a single reaction control system thruster. In Starliner's service module, the leak was detected in plumbing, making up a helium manifold inside one of four doghouse assemblies, spaced around the exterior of the Starliner's drum-shaped service module. Each doghouse features four orbital maneuvering and attitude control thrusters, or OMAC for short, and four small reaction control system maneuvering jets. There are 28 reaction control system thrusters, essentially small rocket engines on the Starliner service module. In orbit, these thrusters are used for minor course corrections and for pointing the spacecraft in the proper direction. The service module has two sets of more powerful engines for larger orbital adjustments and launch abort maneuvers. The spacecraft's propulsion system is pressurized using helium, an inert gas. The thrusters burn a mixture of toxic hydrazine and nitrogen to trioxide propellants. Helium is not combustible or toxic, so a small leak is not likely to be a major safety issue on the ground but the propulsion system must hold pressure for the thrusters to work in space. Bolts were retorqued and engineers believe the system is flight-ready. However, managers decided to pressurize the helium lines throughout the spacecraft, so engineers could monitor them over time to ensure the lines were, in fact, leak-free or within acceptable limits. As a part of the testing, Boeing will bring the propulsion system up to flight pressurization just as it does prior to launch and then allow the helium system to vent naturally to validate existing data and strengthen flight rationale, the company said in a statement. Mission teams also completed a thorough review of the data from the May 6 launch attempt and are not tracking any other issues. Sensors on Starliner first detected suspicious traces of helium inside the propulsion system, while the spacecraft was on the launch pad last week. However, those detections did not initially alarm engineers according to a person briefed on the mission operations. Previously, NASA engineers were baffled as to why the pod that flew in the uncrit Artemis 1 mission back in 2022 returned to Earth with an uneven pattern of wear, but this report goes on to say that the Artemis team has found more than 100 cracks where there shouldn't be. Orion, like many space capsules, uses an ablative material for its heat shield meaning that it's designed to absorb the heat of re-entry and flake off harmlessly instead of transferring that heat to the pod and its contents. So when NASA's engineers found that the char layer had instead been cracking and breaking in larger pieces, well they knew this was not just a random or pattern problem anymore. No damage to the crew module itself has been found, however larger chunks of ablative material would form a trail of dangerous debris rather than turning into flakes of ash. These chunks can then hit the pod or, more likely, tear through its parachutes, 
potentially causing the total loss of the vehicle and any crew on board. Obviously this heat shield issue is the top priority out of the six total issues outlined in the report, and while NASA still isn't certain what exactly is causing the problem, they do have some ideas that could solve it. The first would be to slow down the re-entry speeds. Artemis 1 was already using one of the fastest re-entry profiles for a crew-capable vehicle, and the next missions will reportedly be even faster, reaching speeds of up to 25,000 miles per hour and generating temperatures of about 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's possible that this might be too much for even the robust coating that NASA uses for Orion's heat shield so slowing the re-entry profile could do the trick. The next is a little more obvious, and that is to find a whole new material that could withstand the current Artemis flight path and that does sound like a no-brainer, but the problem is that this would be a very time-consuming and costly procedure which would spur even more tests than any other solution, and it still might not work. The last option comes from the report's recommendation itself. It says very specifically that NASA should ensure the root cause of Orion's heat shield char liberation is well understood prior to the launch of the Artemis II mission. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that the team needs to replace anything or rework any flight plans. Since NASA doesn't really know why this cracking is even happening, it is possible that the engineers could find a reason that has a relatively simple fix and allows them to keep using their current heat shield. However, it is a bit of a long shot at this point. So there's not really a good answer here, each of these options carry their own dangers and expensive setbacks for a mission that has already been delayed in 2025, and that's still only the first issue in the report. NASA also needs to look into a different overheating issue involving the separation bolts on the service module that is normally jettisoned just before re-entry. While giving the Orion its inspection, NASA teams found an unexpected amount of melting that caused a dangerous gap to form on Orion after the separation. The report also points out that NASA's mobile launcher for their SLS rocket was unacceptably damaged during the 2022 Artemis 1 flight, specifically the imaging equipment which the agency uses to help conduct investigations and collect useful data for later launches. The last three recommendations all involve the recovery of the pod at the end of the process, and NASA has reportedly done a great job at making sure those issues have been taken care of. New systems always take a fair bit of work, and we're all used to seeing much larger lists of suggested safety improvements to be made before a rocket can launch, but if NASA can't figure out this issue with their heat shield, it will take more time to fix which could throw off the entire Artemis mission timeline again. A study released on May 2nd has concluded that there is a big problem at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Boeing engineers investigated the helium detections while ULA was replacing the faulty valve on Atlas V and determined that more testing and scrutiny were needed to meet the mission's strict launch safety criteria. It's not big enough. More specifically, the report says that the port and road facilities that service America's biggest space center are in danger of being overwhelmed within the next few years, as the ever-increasing amount of commercial and military activity grows. The biggest factor in these concerns is obviously SpaceX, which currently uses the Canaveral port for their drone ships and other barges that deliver boosters, capsules, and other parts coming and going from the company's facilities at KSC. Nearly a decade ago, in September of 2014, NASA chose two companies, Boeing and Elon Musk's SpaceX, to design a new class of private spacecraft that could transport humans to low Earth orbit. SpaceX, which received an initial $2.6 billion as part of the program, has already fulfilled its side of the bargain. But in addition to SpaceX, the United Launch Alliance, Blue Origin, and Relativity Space, all make regular use of the port with Blue Origin and Relativity set to increase their operation footprint at the spaceport over the next few years. And of course, the whole facility belongs to NASA and the U.S. government who operate their own flights and recovery operations there as well. In 2020, its Crew Dragon spacecraft launched its first humans to space for NASA and it has since carried nearly 50 people, both government astronauts and paying customers, such as the U.S. billionaire Jared Isigman, into space. Boeing, which received $4.2 billion, has had a much more troubled path with Starliner. Have you ever pondered why NASA persists in its pursuit of the Starliner despite already possessing the Dragon? Having two different U.S. crewed vehicles is really important for us, emphasized NASA's Dana Weigel. We're the current manager for the ISS during a conference on the 3rd. This crewed flight test is a critical stepping stone to reaching that broader goal. It's a reminder that progress often demands redundancy and diversity, 
and yet as we venture into the unknown, uncertainty remains our constant companion. We don't know where this perfect dream will lead us, but we fervently hope there won't be any accidents. The truth is, space is inherently risky. It's precisely this element of danger that makes exploration so thrilling and meaningful. Amidst the challenges, there's a glimmer of hope for another pioneering company, Blue Origin. Their human spaceflight dry spell is poised to break this weekend, pending a smooth execution. Jeff Bezos' spaceflight venture revealed on the 14th of May that it's setting its sights on Sunday, the 19th, for its upcoming suborbital space tourism endeavor. Dubbed NS-25, this mission will soar from Blue Origin's West Texas launch site, with liftoff scheduled for a window opening at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. It's a testament to the perseverance and innovation that drives humanity's quest for the stars. As its name suggests, NS-25 marks the 25th liftoff of the New Shepard spacecraft. However, it'll only be the seventh crewed launch for this versatile vehicle, which also serves in robotic research missions. Blue Origin temporarily grounded New Shepard while investigating an anomaly attributed to a thermal structural failure of the nozzle on the rocket's single B-3PM engine. After devising a fix, the suborbital vehicle returned to flight in December of 2023 with the uncrewed NS-24 mission. Last month, Blue Origin unveiled the crew for the forthcoming NS-25 mission. The six passengers comprise a diverse group. Ed Dwight, the U.S.'s first-ever black astronaut candidate, venture capitalist Mason Angel, Sylvain Chiron, the founder of French craft brewery Brasserie Mont Blanc, entrepreneur Kenneth L. Hess, retired accountant Carol Schaller, and pilot and aviator Gopi Todakura. Each individual brings a unique perspective and background to this extraordinary journey. If all proceeds according to plan, another suborbital tourism mission will take flight just a few weeks after NS-25. Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin's primary competitor in this arena, has set its sights on June 8 for its Galactic 7 flight, accommodating four passengers. On May 10, the Federal Aviation Administration announced that they were going to be conducting a more in-depth review of SpaceX and the impact their Starship rockets might have on the environment. Surrounding the Kennedy Space Center A preliminary environmental assessment had been made by NASA back in 2019. The FAA says that this was more of a baseline and that things have progressed enough with the new SpaceX Super Heavy vehicle that they would need to conduct a proper environmental impact statement before they could be cleared to fly from the Cape. It means that SpaceX is a lot closer to being able to launch from the Florida coast than it might seem, and possibly the new report on the spaceport expansion has spurred all the regulatory bodies involved to get their paperwork done before people start getting grumpy with them about holding up any launches. This expansion plan is certainly a lot of hefty labor, but it is a relatively simple plan. Widening the major waterway used by the commercial companies at KSC would go a long way to easing that particular bottleneck and allow for increased pace of some lighter operations. There's no word on when work will officially start, of course, but the idea is to get funding for the whole thing using federal transportation grants, otherwise NASA would have to pay for the work by raising the fees on local shipping, which would sort of defeat the point. The space race is heating up and it makes sense for the U.S. government to support the growth of their spaceport lest they fall behind rivals like China. Commercial space companies are gearing up to try their hand at the next great frontier of resource-hunting mining asteroids. The idea is hardly new, landing on or capturing any of the rocky mineral-rich asteroids that float around our solar system has been an idea in science fiction and in actual mission planning for decades now. Many of these rocks are filled with extremely precious materials like platinum and cobalt, which are used in electronics and batteries for electric vehicles. Even the ice that forms on comets, for instance, could be used to make propellant for our spacecraft. But despite the allure of grabbing these materials, nothing's been done in the field until very recently. The problem is that until those new accords, it wasn't really clear if it was even legal for a company to mine anything. The older Outer Space Treaty did lay the groundwork, however, saying that while no one could claim a part of a non-terrestrial body, they could lay claim to any material they dug up. That's what has led to more modern legislation that backs up a country or company's right to own anything they collect out in space, and so mining seems to be something that's protected whether on the moon or elsewhere. And there are, of course, a lot more reasons than just these two, like the sheer amount of new technology, making it easier to visit and dig on the moon, Mars or asteroids and comets, as well as just a ton more data and telemetry we've gathered since the 60s that help to pinpoint valuable space rocks. 
and with newer environmental legislations designed to stop harmful mining practices here, it's slowly becoming more profitable to mine in space. And that's about it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. And that's all for today's update. If you enjoyed watching and found it useful, please make sure to subscribe to my channel and hit the like button. And if you want to support our channel and if you want to be up to date, you can become an exclusive member. So click on our perks through the link in the description below. Thanks to watching and see you next time.